I'm Alex. I, I work at Ink and Switch maintaining uh, Automerge. You can find me on the web here. Um, I've got nine minutes and 50 seconds to kind of speed run the requirements and design decisions that we've made for the thinking of this. Uh, plus five minutes for questions is great. Uh, so um, what we're trying to build here is a, a local first end-to-end -end encrypted sync system for Automerge documents. That's, that's kind of the, the thing that I'm interested in building right now. Um, but because it's end-to-end -end encrypted, it doesn't really care about the contents of the things that it's syncing. So it's really anything that's shaped like a commit graph, which is what Automerge is. Um, so it hopefully can be quite general. Um, there's some requirements for the way that we use Automerge uh, that come come out of uh, the way that sorry the way that users typically use Automerge. So first off, we expect to have thousands to tens of thousands of linked documents per user. Think like a a big wiki or um, a user's notes over a long period of time. Um, and we also expect those documents to have very granular history. We produce a commit per keystroke, which means that we can use the same sync substrate for long running offline, like asynchronous collaboration and live collaboration. Um, and it also gives us lots of nice version control features. We can produce really good diffs. Um, and we want to solve the aeroplane problem, which is what I call this problem where you and I are collaborating on something at the airport, and we're synchronizing via a sync server, which is just another node that happens to be very online, very available. Uh, and then we get on the airplane, and we now have to synchronize between our two laptops via the terrible plane Wi-Fi. Um, and we have mostly the same data. We just synced via the same sync server. But we've never talked to each other before. And we want the amount of data that we have to exchange over this crappy connection to be proportional to the amount of changes that we're actually making at that time. Um, and that rules out a bunch of designs that we otherwise might use. Uh, OK, so what are we synchronizing? We're synchronizing the graph of operations that Brooke was just talking about that determines who has access to what documents. Um, and then underneath that, we're synchronizing the actual commit graph, which contains the content of each document. And I think of this as two layers, a bit like this. And the reason I think of that as two layers is because we have to synchronize it in two stages. Because first, we have to synchronize the auth graph that determines as Brooke mentioned, what things we think the other side should be allowed to fetch from us and what we think the other end will let us write to and read from. And then we've synchronized the commit graph for each document. Um, all right, so how do we synchronize the auth graph? Well, we can't just send the whole auth graph on each sync request because there's a lot of ops. Each operation is around 300 bytes. There's one per access control operation, like creating a doc or adding someone. Lots of ops, lots of docs. We're going to have like tens of megabytes of ops to exchange. We can't be doing that on every sync. Um, so we just kind of ignore the internal structure of the, uh, the auth graph and treat it as a big bag of operations that we need to synchronize. And now we have a set reconciliation problem. We have two nodes, Alice and Bob. They have mostly the same ops, and they want to synchronize the difference between those ops. And there's loads of ways to do this. We use a, an algorithm called a Ribbelt, Rateless Invertible Bloom Filter Lookup Tables. Great. Uh, and <laughs> um, that has this really nice property that the amount of information that you have to send to synchronize is 1.3 to 1.7 times the size of the things that are out of sync. Um, so for the airplane problem, that's amazing. We're only sending the data that's different, effectively. Um, and it also allows us to tune the number of network round trips we do based on network conditions. It's not built into the data structure. Um, Great, OK, so now we have to synchronize the documents. And we do that by first figuring out which documents are out of sync, and then synchronizing the out of sync documents. Um, doing it this way around means that we can prioritize documents that are out of sync that we care about more, like ones that are currently in the UI. Um, so how do we synchronize which docs are out of sync? Well, we can represent each document as a document ID version pair. We have a set of document ID version pairs. We do set reconciliation. Um, and we can use Ribble for that as well. Um, and we can actually combine the two calls so that in the common case where one document has changed, uh, we can figure out figure that out in one round trip. Um, great. OK, we've synchronized the auth graph. We've synchronized which documents are out of sync. Now we're synchronizing an individual document. Well, key hub documents are just commit graphs. We can represent them as individual commits. The punchline to this doesn't land as well because Brooke told you about the compression, because this doesn't work by set reconciliation. We can't use set reconciliation for this. We have to. We have to handle compression. Um, so we want per keystroke changes. So we're going to produce a lot of commits. Um, and each of those commits is going to have a hash and a signature, so a 64x overhead on your average keystroke. Uh, and then we're also going to have metadata about the commit, such as the insertion index, like where did we put this keystroke. 
Um, and that means, you know, for a typical ink and switch essay, we're going to have tens of megabytes of hashes before we even get into the 700 kilobytes of actual text that we care about. Um, and in AutoMerge, we solve this by compressing the document. So the way that compression works is typically AutoMerge documents are this shape. They're very long with very occasional concurrence, concurrency because most of the time when you're typing or making changes, they're sequential, one after the other. So first off, we don't need to send all the hashes. We can just send the start and end hashes and regenerate the intermediate ones. And we also can run length encode a lot of the content. So we end up with a kind of 10% overhead on the actual metadata that we need to send. Uh, which is great. That makes AutoMerge and other similar systems like it plausible um, and like feasible. We don't have to download giant amounts of data every time we sync. But we can't do it when we're end-to-end -end encrypted uh, because the server needs access to the plain text in order to compress things. So if I'm a, like downloading a document for the first time from a sync server, the server at the moment would dynamically compress the, do the document because it's received a bunch of commits over time from different um, peers and it will compress the document and send me the compressed version of the document. And to end encrypted, we can't do that. And likewise, we can't upload compressed do documents to the sync server because it won't be able to uncompress it in order to be able to send those commits individually, um, incrementally to, to clients who are halfway sync. So. Uh, so what can we do? Well, one thing you might think is we can have the clear text nodes do the compression and upload it, um, which is a nice idea, but it raises some questions. What happens if two clients compress slightly different versions of the doc and upload them? The server has no way of knowing that they're mostly overlapping, so it just has to hold on to both of them. And then when you sync, it has to give you both of them. And when do clients actually compress? We're leaving some kind of very important configuration parameter unspecified here, so you'll get some weird, unpredictable behavior based on when people decide it's a good idea to compress. Um, what we want is some kind of way where we have a document, say this is Bob's version of the document, and he's, he's got some mechanism which has allowed him to decide that these are the two chunks that he should compress the document to. And Alice has this version of the document, and she agrees on the two chunks, which Bob has, but the extra changes that she has, she would put in these other chunk, this other chunk. And the, the kind of property that we want is regardless of what data you have and someone else has, the overlapping stuff should end up in the same chunks you should always just have a, an increasing set of chunks and never have different chunk, uh, different data in the same chunk. There's two insights that make this possible. One is that regardless of what's happening concurrently, for a given commit, the parents of that commit never change. And we can use the number of leading zeros, as, as Brooke said, to figure out where to start a new chunk. So if we have this commit graph, um, and we start at the tips of the graph, so there's two runs through this graph, and let's say the solid commits are, have two leading zeros, well, we get this kind of chunking up of the document. Um, and that turns into this set of blocks. And this already has got some really nice properties. Those chunks are, on average, because the hash is uh, random, probabilistically about 100 changes long, 100 commits long. Um, and so we could just chuck those into our set reconciliation algorithm and sync, and that would work pretty well. But we can go a bit further, and we can say, well, let's say this had three leading zeros, this, this commit here. And we can create another chunk out of this that sits underneath uh, the, the first two chunks. And this has this nice property that it's a bigger chunk. Three leading zeros are probabilistically larger, because it takes you get them every 1,000 changes rather than every 100. And it contains the previous two chunks in the sense that it's the same set of commits. And this is why we call it a sediment tree, because it's like a tree structure where the larger chunks at the root of the tree are older. Um, Anyway, it's nice, because uh, we have this feature where in order to communicate this um, tree structure, we actually only have to send the beginning and end hashes of each chunk, and we have exponentially fewer chunks the, um, the further you go back in time. So for a million doc change, we're going to send like tens of hashes to explain how many chunks you need to download. And on each chunk, yes, yeah, so there we go, on each chunk, we can put the size of the chunk, so we can make a progress bar for each document saying, you know, you need to download these extra chunks, it's going to take this long. Um, and the tree itself is also a CRDT, so you don't need to coordinate writes to storage. When you're producing these chunks, you can just write them. Whoever's synchronizing can load out storage up whenever they like. You can, you can take advantage of the eventually consistent properties of the underlying CRDT that you're syncing without losing the benefit of compression. So, all right, <laughs> pretty good. Uh, we have. For the common case, we have one document has a new commit. We sync in one round trip. We send pretty much just that commit. Um, 
for a larger divergence, we still have bandwidth proportional to the difference in the, the data that we have, so we've solved the airplane problem. Um, we still get fast initial sync because we're still using the compression um, that, uh, in this case, auto merge works uses. But um, uh, okay, I'm done. Second, so yeah, uh, and yeah, but the project status was the one thing I wanted to talk about. So the, right now, we're still implementing all of this stuff. Um, we have prototypes that uh, have auto, uh, work with auto merge and auto merge repo. Um, but everything we're building, all of the libraries that we're building, uh, don't know anything about auto merge, uh, are intentionally designed to be usable with other data structures, anything that you can express as a commit graph, um, and also designed to be usable in, like the, the core implementation is, a, is it designed to be used via FFI in lots of different platforms, so we don't have to keep rewriting it. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you.